Good afternoon, everybody, or good noon, I guess I should say, because it's, it's noon at this moment. And uh, it's, uh, I'm delighted to be here. I know my colleagues are delighted to be here, too. And I've been invited by, um, by the conference and by the Latvian Ministry of Defense uh, to talk about the gray zone. And uh, credit to the organizers to, for calling it the gray zone, uh, because uh, often when we talk about aggression below the, the level of, of armed conflict, it's, it's referred to as hybrid. Well, hybrid is the combination of armed conflict and means uh, below the, uh, the threshold of armed conflict. So every war, in a sense, is hybrid. But what we want to talk about are all the things that, that countries can and are doing below that uh, level of, of um, sustained use of force. And unfortunately, uh, the, the panel was extremely well-timed because Belarus has been providing us with plenty of, of fodder for discussion over the past few weeks and hasn't stopped. Um, so it's, uh, it's a delight to be here. And I, I want to make this uh, an interactive session because you all have insights uh, that, that are uh, very valuable for your respective countries as well. But we'll start with a, a somewhat more dis a distant country, which is Canada. And I know the defense minister has a few words he wants to say. So let's start with the Canadian minister of defense, and then we'll move on to the panel. Colleagues and friends, greetings from Canada. Bonjour. Thank you for inviting me to participate in this year's Riga conference. As minister of national defense, I'm always glad to provide a Canadian perspective alongside my esteemed colleagues. No matter on which side of the Atlantic we live, we face an increasingly complex, competitive and connected world. A world where ideas, capital and threats against people and nations move at lightning speed. Where rapid advances in technology over the past decade have changed how we communicate and changed the very nature of conflict itself. In this rapidly changing environment, Canada is ready to take on the challenge shoulder to shoulder with our allies. We know that our adversaries are using sophisticated and coordinated campaigns across diplomatic, information, military, and economic spheres. And we know they are doing this just below the threshold of armed conflict in hopes of achieving their objectives, including disinformation campaigns and harmful cyber activities. Now, such tactics are deployed in an incremental manner and are designed to evade a response. These actions also have important implications for societies and our militaries. That's because these tactics aim to weaken the institutions and alliances that defend our security and way of life. They skew the debate about the threat they pose, and they try to erode our political unity and our will to resist these actions in the first place. For our part in Canada, we have remained steadfast in calling out irresponsible state-sponsored activity. This July, I issued a statement alongside Canada's Minister of Foreign Affairs in which we identified the People's Republic of China and its state-backed actors for compromising an estimated 400,000 Microsoft Exchange servers. It's vitally important that we stand up against unacceptable activities, no matter where they take place, while staying true to our democratic values. We collectively need to stay a step ahead of those seeking to harm our interests. We must keep developing the capabilities we need to keep pace with emerging threats. And we need to keep coordinating with our allies and partners between governments and civil society, academia, NGOs, and private enterprise as well. Though each NATO member has a primary responsibility for deterring and responding to threats on their own soil, we know that all too often these threats are not contained within borders. And that makes sharing best practices critically important. Learning from one another, like Latvia's efforts to boost media literacy amongst its population, is a perfect example of how we can learn to work together to fight against dis- and misinformation. We also recognize that many below the threshold cyber activities pose defense and national security challenges that require governments, militaries, and other partners to respond jointly. For example, our experts at the Canadian Centre for Cybersecurity provide unique perspectives and insights. 
They have been early leaders in identifying and communicating to Canadians the shifting threat landscape brought on by the pandemic. And the work they continue to do helps make online spaces safer for Canadians. Our armed forces also have a unique set of perspectives, expertise and capabilities that can be called upon. They play a key role in shaping our whole of government responses to existing and emerging challenges. From the international norms that underpin the future of warfare to space, AI or quantum technology. In Canada, we understand that operational readiness depends on keeping pace with technological change. So we are striving to anticipate, adapt and act. I outlined this approach as a top priority when I unveiled Canada's defence policy four years ago. The landscape has continued evolving since then, but the need to keep pace remains constant. We know our adversaries are continually striving to close the technological gap and trying to challenge our alliance. We must, and we will, stay a step ahead, for example, through investment in R&D, innovation, and strengthening our cyber defences by working together, sharing ideas and best practices. And with so much of today's conflict happening below the traditional threshold of conflict, we need to rethink how we orient our defences and how we work across government, through our societies and amongst allies and partners. To help counter these evolving threats, Canada continues leading one of NATO's four multinational enhanced forward presence battle groups in the Baltic region, which includes soldiers just up the road from Riga. Now in total, we currently have more than 800 personnel stationed across Central and Eastern Europe contributing to security and deterrence measures alongside our allies. When we work in coalitions like these, we show by working together that we are truly greater than the sum of our parts. Now back here in Canada, the challenge is a bit different. We need to defend all domains in a vast expanse of Northern Territory including hundreds of thousands of kilometers of coastline. And the Canadian Armed Forces must be able to watch, act, deter, and defend all approaches from land, sea, air, cyber, and space. This starts with providing our military with the right tools to enhance situational awareness. It means working with our American colleagues in NORAD, our transatlantic colleagues in NATO, our Arctic allies and partners, and collaborating with Five Eyes, the United Nations, and our own domestic partners. We need to be ready and able to push back against below the threshold threats, and we are. We will continue spurring innovation to get those advanced capabilities online in our militaries. We have worked to deepen relationships with industry and academics. Just as we work to modernize our capabilities in a range of areas to defend our sovereignty, and with leaders endorsing the NATO 2030 agenda this summer, we have the momentum we need to ensure NATO is strong and united for this new era of global competition. By 2030, I certainly anticipate a more contested threat environment in cyberspace and outer space, in the Arctic and underwater, a world that will be under increasing pressure from climate change and technologies that threaten our security. Despite these challenges, and the way conflict is continuing to evolve on and off the battlefield, I want you to know that our allies can continue counting on Canada as a trusted transatlantic partner. So thank you, and I wish I could join you in person for what I know will be a great discussion. Well, that was a perfect summary of what, what we're going to discuss. <laughs> uh, so, uh, well, it's, it's, uh, I think the, the point is here that, that uh, within uh, the wider alliance, NATO, the EU, and, and its friends and their friends, there is agreement that the gray zone constitutes a big problem uh, or a big challenge, and there is also agreement that we can learn from one another. And that's a good point uh, from which to start. And if, uh, if it's okay with you, Minister Publics, I'll start with you since you're our host and since Latvia just happens to be one of those countries that, that are uh, the most innovative when it comes to grey zone defence. And uh, I think of grey zone defence as the defender's dilemma, which uh, I also chose as the title for, for the new book that, that I wrote about it, but because it, the grey zone is so tricky and so attractive to the aggressor because you can keep innovating and you can use, uh, keep using means that the defender can't use. You can't, for example, uh, no country 
would send, uh, would uh, weaponize migrants in response to uh, an aggressive weaponizing migrants. So what do you do? Uh, with that, uh, I want to start with you, Minister Pabriks, and, and uh, hear from you what you consider the most serious uh, uh, threats in the gray zone, the most serious forms of aggression, the most concerning forms of aggression in the gray zone at the moment. Well, I think we probably have to turn back to the basics and to the, to the definitions once we speak about something new and something challenging. And um, if I have to try to define uh, the century we are living in, 21st century, I would like to suggest that we are living in a century of confusion because of uh, changes in societal material, uh, technological revolution, artificial intelligence, and that basically means that, uh, uh, that all confusion is actually leading us in a number of spheres into the gray zone, because the gray zone purpose by itself is to confuse people, to confuse decision makers, to make them not understand anymore what is black and white, because it's gray, to uh, make them not understand how to act, because once you cannot clearly define the situation, also your activities are hindered. And from that perspective, I think uh, at this moment we are speaking about the military part or defense or security part more, but we can easily reflect this gray zone situation also to the number of other societal um, a matter, either it is a fight with uh, COVID-19, where we can see that there is a movement against vaccination, there is a movement for something else. People are confused between their individual rights and collective rights. So I think we have to see this in the wider context. Now, about the gray zone in security and military matters, I think that uh, the country or organizations or whoever is uh, committing this gray zone attack under the radar, which we cannot immediately describe, detect, and define, they know what they are doing. The problem is that those who are attacked cannot so easily define this. And uh, if I'm looking now, for instance, to our responses to such type of attacks, like for instance, uh, uh, use of migrants by the state authorities of Belarus, for instance, as a hybrid attack on our borders, on EU borders, on NATO borders. I would say that we don't need to prove this to Belarusians or to Russians. We need to um, try to confirm this and to explain to our partners to whom we ask for assistance in this case, because this is not only a problem for us, it's a problem for whole Europe, for whole continent. And from that perspective, I think we are behind the challenge of 21st century, because we created this possibility by our technologies, by our changing value systems, by our, let's say, turbulent requests for different lifestyles, which we can see in the developed liberal Western world, but we are behind the schedule of adaptation. So, uh, that is the largest challenge in my understanding, that we are not ready to respond correctly to this. And uh, if we are using the migrant hybrid attacks on our border as a case study, then I would say we are lacking behind with uh, strategic communication. We are lacking behind with uh, practical responses. For instance, uh, if we are talking about uh, strategic communication, then we can see, uh, I will not be afraid, those who know me, they know that uh, I'm speaking very straight, I will not be afraid to tell that uh, there is a use of so-called useful idiots, in this case, or in our societies, who are not willing to see this as a hybrid attack, but they are um, uh, suggesting the traditional, if I may say so, medicine to this case. They simply say, look, here you can see that refugees are coming, and we have to help them. And of course, it is in some way a challenge to our humanitarian feelings once we see these people on our borders. But at the same time, the cost to follow to that suggestion and medicine, what these people are suggesting, will be overwhelming negative to whole European continent. Uh, as a practical response, I could use, for instance, the latest answers of um, 
EU Commissioner Johansson. When we have been asking, and Latvia is not the only country which is attacked, when we have been asking, look, we have hundreds of kilometers open border. We need the new equipment. We need new installations. We need cameras. We need resources to detect all this. Can you, as an organization, assist us financially? Because it's not just our national border. Then the answer was very simple. Well, we can grant you some finances. Uh, and I apologize if I'm not fully 100% correct. But we can grant you assistance to organize the refugee camps. But we can't grant you assistance to um, make these installments at the border. So because it will look bad. That is a misunderstanding of concept of the gray zone attack. And that is the most worrying. I don't need to convince somebody in Minsk or, or Moscow. My problem is that we are for decades fighting you know, with our friends and allies to make them timely to understand that there is a problem and we have to act. You're absolutely right. Now, I think of, of, of gray zone aggression as uh, geopolitical gaslighting, where the, the target, the country, isn't really sure whether it's aggression happening or just uh, an inconvenience, just something you can disregard. But when you realize, at the, at the, at the point when you realize that it's serious, it's usually too late. And, 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 and that is obviously part of the confusion that the attacker can use, uh, the confusion uh, causing confusion not just among decision makers, but, about the, but uh, among the public as well, uh, as to whether action is needed or whether, as the, whether it's just an inconvenience that, that you can live with. Uh, I'm so delighted that Minister Heape is here. Uh, the UK is, is a, uh, um, all of a sudden a, um, a pioneer, one might say, uh, or I would say, in, in, um, in addressing gray zone challenges. Just a few years ago, it was, uh, um, I hope nobody minds me saying this, but it was hard to convince the UK government that, that these sort of threats were worth taking seriously. And, and the UK government still believed in, in its fantastic tool, the armed forces, as, as the answer to most, in fact, uh, all national security challenges. Then came the integrated review with a fantastic shift of focus towards uh, uh, whole of society, uh, the whole of society approach, societal resilience. So I'm delighted you're here, Minister, and, and I would love to hear from you as well the, what you consider the, 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 what you consider the most serious challenges to be at the moment. And we should remember that the UK has faced not just um, uh, subversive investments uh, and acquisitions of, of key UK companies, but also uh, um, a quite uh, upsetting incident of, of uh, well, a, a murder in Salisbury that one could say, well, it was just, it's just a, it's an isolated case. But you can also say it's, it's part of, of gray zone aggression and causing confusion and instability in the targeted countries. Over to you. Well, Elizabeth, thank you very much. And um, I scribbled down Salisbury as you were talking because I, you know, your, what, what led to that UK epiphany will, will have been a series of things. I mean, people, I think, will have been observing in Whitehall that the way that we were being challenged was changing. But clearly, Salisbury was a moment that really um, took everybody back and made everybody realize that we can be challenged deep in our own territory with a very dangerous um, uh, chemical agent that it doesn't achieve the threshold. No one's going to start a war over it but had to be responded to. And it needed to be responded to with all the levers of government, not just militarily. And so I think um, as a way of catalyzing UK thinking going into the IR, Salisbury was, was a pivotal moment. Um, before I sort of get into the, the, the three points I want to uh, make in opening, could I just use this as an opportunity to um, remark on the murder of Sir David Amos, uh, a British parliamentarian uh, yesterday afternoon when he was going about his, his normal business. It's far too early to say what the motives were of his murderer, but he was a fantastic colleague and will be missed by all in the House of Commons. And he was a great servant of our, our democracy. And I really don't want to link that to, to what I'm about to talk about, but I do think that when these moments happen, when your democracy is challenged through the, the murder of a member of your legislature, or the protests that turned so violent in Washington in the run-up to the inauguration, 
how you respond as a nation, how you show your values as a nation in response to those sorts of challenges is part of this competition for ideas and showing that even when you are challenged at the very heart of your democracy, the values that you as a nation hold dear remain steadfast and you don't deviate from them. That's a shining light for people around the world who deal with this sort of challenge to their civic structures all too frequently and where their authoritarian governments respond in an entirely different, inappropriate way. The fact that the UK, the US, other countries who have been through situations like this can respond in a balanced way that is consistent with the way, with the values that they espouse internationally. That is, that is part of the competition that we're, we're now in. And that leads me to, to my first point. I think that our new foreign secretary is absolutely right in what she has said on a number of occasions in the, the, the first few weeks of her tenure, where we should, you know, we're back into a competition of ideas. We've become complacent over the last 30 years since the fall of the Berlin Wall in just believing that the world is now um, on, a, on a journey to sort of freedom, democracy, and that therefore we should take for granted the freedoms that we enjoy within the Western Alliance. And that's not the case anymore. There are countries like China, like Russia, like Iran, who actively seek to promote a different way of doing government. They see value, they see, they see strength in a different type of government. And that means that we can no longer be so complacent about what it is that makes it so special to live in the free, open, tolerant societies that we now live in. And so as politicians, our willingness to stand up and talk about freedom is important not just so that we are communicating with audiences in Russia and China who I think sort of instinctively know that to be free is better than not, but also to domestic audiences who all too often are on the receiving end of the sort of disinformation that Harjit and artists have spoken about. And for them to just instinctively know that the disinformation that they're receiving on their Facebook timelines, it doesn't ring true that they know that they live in a society that, although imperfect, is still liberal, tolerant, democratic, and free. And if we forget to talk about these things, then that disinformation strikes a chord. And that's part of the problem. It's not just the technical stuff of not allowing those social media platforms to spread this sort of information in the first place. The people who are reading it need to make, we need, we need to help them to make sure that it rings hollow and they don't trust what they're seeing. The next thing is that the fashion is to talk about the gray zone. Uh, that is very important. That is the point of competition. But the only reason that our adversaries have moved into the gray zone is because our hard power as an alliance within NATO is so overwhelming that military competition is not the preferred route to achieving your aims. And so as countries like the UK went through our integrated review process, there was a balancing act to strike. Because on the one hand, you need to invest in the new capabilities in cyber and in information maneuver. You need to reconfigure your armed forces to be able to compete in the gray zone. But on the other, if you remove investment in, in our case, our nuclear deterrent and in our conventional armed forces, then what we do is we change the equation for those on, who are our adversaries and we make them perhaps see that there might be a military solution and the gray zone is no longer the place in which they want to play out their competition. The final thing that I'd say, and this is the bit that's most challenging for those of us in ministries of defense, where we like to believe we are the answer to all problems, is that having pushed our adversaries into a place where they are operating below the, below the threshold, very often, the way in which we compete with them beneath the threshold, the way in which we respond to their challenges are not things that are delivered by our nation's militaries. We've invested heavily in a new, in a new national cyber force, so clearly the MOD has function in competition in cyberspace. But when it comes to competition 
in the form of illegal migration, when it comes to competition in the form of disinformation, when it comes to competition in the form of uh, trying to buy up countries in order, uh, companies in order to steal IP, that's not something that ministries of defense respond to. And so the integrated review, the clue was in the title, was about integrating all of the tools of the UK state. So it's not just the MOD as the vehicle for competition. Right. It's the whole of government competing because that's the only effective way to succeed against our adversaries below the threshold. Thank you. That's absolutely the case. And thank you for mentioning uh, Sir David. Um, um, I, I think uh, we have all been shaken by the news. And I would also like to, to send a thought to Oyas Kalnins, who no doubt would have been here today. Uh, but who uh, obviously died uh, a few weeks ago, uh, not of any nefarious uh, causes, uh, but who uh, is no longer with us and, and uh, yeah, was a, a steadfast defender of all the things we're talking about today. Um, so uh, he's sorely missed. Uh, with that, over to you, Ian. I know you'll take a, a, a somewhat more, uh, um, maybe a, a more international uh, view on, on gray zone challenges. And uh, Ian, as we know, is uh, a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, my condolences to Sir David. That's a tremendous loss. You know, I'll just make five quick, quick points, kind of high level points on hybrid warfare. One is the very obvious. It's a reality. It's a daily part of our life. And my colleague just mentioned that assassinations energy cutoffs, the exploitation of, mig of migrants, election interference in Germany, United States, Chinese, in Chinese intimidation to Lithuania, Australia, economically. I mean, it is a daily, daily event. And thinking of the title, you know, gray zone, title of our panel here, gray zone, battle space, fighting the war, maintaining the peace, P maintaining the peace. Well, it's very clear, we're not maintaining the peace because these assaults are occurring every day in multiple forms. And if we're fighting the war, the big concern I have is we're constantly on the defensive. And that's a really important point. We should be doing better. And that's my second point, because hybrid warfare, it's not a new, it's not a new game. And in fact, the West was extremely good at this game during the Cold War. One of the reasons why we won the Cold War is because we were so sharp on this game. You know, we had, support to dissident movements in our, against our, in our adversary countries. We had extremely developed uh, uh, communications agencies, Radio Free Liberty, Radio Europe, United States Information Agency. We had student exchanges. We were constantly on this game. We were leveraging economic power. Uh, we had our own hybrid strategy. We've done it before. Uh, we, we can do it again. We can do it better. It is different, and that's my third point. The, the hybrid warfare, the hybrid game of today is very different than that of the 1980s, 1990s, and the Cold War. It's more complex. It's more multidimensional. It's faster. The tools allow for more dynamic, disruptive uh, in impact. It's harder to discern. It's harder to attribute. It requires better intelligence so you can anticipate what's going to happen. You need faster decision making, faster action, and above all, you have to be more effective in terms of coordinating. You can't have the military doing one thing, your information people doing something else, your economic people doing something else. They have to be all coordinated, and that takes time and effort. My fourth point is, and getting into the discussion in, uh, of, of this panel, is getting involved in hybrid warfare does not require us to abandon our values. In fact, it requires us to leverage our, our values and our additional strengths. We have the advantage, inherent advantage in information operations because we have the truth behind us. It's just to be more effective in pushing that out. We have advantages economically. And this is an important sub-point. To be effective in, in hybrid warfare, like in conventional warfare, you have to be willing to take sacrifice. You can't be effective in this game assuming there will be no pain. And I think a classic example of this is our response to Russian energy intimidation. Why is it that we continue to buy Russian oil and gas? And I'm not just saying this of Europe. I look at the United States where we have shipments of mazut coming in. But if we're going to cut off those shipments, it requires us to pay a price. Are our societies, are our governments willing to pay that price? 
And then finally, you have to have capacity. And in some ways, we've kind of neutered ourselves since the Cold War. I'll just use the United States as an example. We used to have the United States Information Agency. And it was shut down in 1998. In 1998, it had a $3 billion budget to do nothing but strategic communications and engagement, to be the pointy edge of the spear in a hybrid warfare. Yet we shut that down. We do not allocate the same amount of resources to the domain as we did in the past, and we have to. In the case of the United States, we need to reanimate USIA, of course, with, with new dimensions and social media and such. And I'll just end with a question. The question is, if we're going to be effective, if we're going to manage risk in this day and age, can we afford to be solely on the defensive in this hybrid domain? You could say we're doing OK, we're holding back. But the fact is, when you have this constant attacks, at some point there's going to be miscalculation, mistaken response with risks that could lead to a dramatic escalation. I think only if we go on the offense are we going to be more effective in terms of deterring hybrid warfare and actually bringing us to the peace. Thank you, Ian. Um, I see a number of excellent questions on Slido, which reminds me to mention that uh, feel free to think of your questions and maybe start waving already, because I see we only have 28 minutes left. And also, feel free to tweet, and the hashtag is RigaConf2021. But I have to take this opportunity to highlight some of the best practices that are, going, that are happening, that are being uh, developed and implemented by a number of uh, NATO, uh, a small number, but uh, are being uh, developed and implemented by NATO and EU member states. And the, the big advantage that, that uh, as, as uh, our Canadian friend mentioned, the big advantage that we have is that although we are free and open societies and we are being targeted, the big advantage that we have is that we have friends and we can learn from one another. And, and that, by the way, means, uh, from my perspective, a complete shift in, in how NATO and EU member states uh, think of one another. It has always been the case that in, the US, in, in, in NATO, uh, the, the large countries have not mattered the most because they have the most armed forces. In the gray zone, the, a number of smaller countries, including our, our host country here, are innovating and coming up with new ideas that larger countries would struggle to come up with simply because they have much larger, larger bureaucracies. They can learn from those smaller NATO member states, which means me, leads me to you, Minister, um, because Latvia has been innovating uh, a great deal in, in involving the whole of, of society in, in, uh, in not just in responding, but in, in deterrence, meaning signaling resilience to, to uh, would-be uh, pr prospective aggression and, and indeed actual aggression. Well, thank you for noticing Latvian efforts. In order to explain what we are doing, and I must say that we are still very far from the great success, but uh, I have to continue with what James uh, just mentioned, that uh, defense ministries, people who uh, are engaged daily with security and defense, they cannot be anymore the sole institution which is dealing with this. We need the daily involvement of many other institutions, other ministries, municipalities, general public, because uh, if we would not engage them, that basically would mean that, uh, how to say, Ministry of Defense would have to take over most of the uh, area which is existing in, in politics, and that's not what this is simply cannot happen. So from that perspective, we introduced in Latvia a so-called comprehensive defense system, where we are trying to educate and prepare the other institutions, which means ministries, other state institutions, municipal institutions, and private uh, enterprises with uh, different dark, gray, black scenarios, what might happen. And we are asking them, what will you do in such a situation? Because we, in, in defense, we will be busy. What will be your response? So that means that, for instance, once per year, we're bringing our government out into the tents in forest, and we are playing a game. We are making such games for Ministry of uh, Transport, for Ministry of Education, for Ministry of Health, etc. We are uh, making our uh, military uh, maneuvers or exercises on the streets of Riga and not in the polygons, because we have to defend our cities in such a situation. And frequently, such defense will happen, as we can see from experience of other countries. It will happen in a parallel way. So there might be a street 
fight. And at the same time, in some other quarter of the city, people will still go for shopping. And somebody else will still observe it and, and, and watch it on YouTube or somewhere else. So that is a real uh, scenario we try to uh, investigate and try to build the resilience of our society. But this is a technical response. And of course, we as a smaller country are sometimes placed in a better situation because we can move as a small boat faster than a great tanker. So we would like to see this as an example for other countries, uh, as an example for maybe such organizations as NATO and EU to investigate from our experience, from our mistakes, to see how can we can adjust to this. But I would like to move uh, still in one minute from this particular, because I can tell a lot what we are doing, OK? But uh, particular from particular part to the general part. And I think that the general problem uh, why we are behind uh, to give the answer to such type of a gray zone attacks to us is that we still do not grasp really the seriousness of those changes which are happening in our societies. And I would like to describe them, and sorry, I probably there will be a lot of people who will disagree with me, but I would like to say that we are somehow changing steadiness and our ability to stand for principles to compromise. We are starting to enjoy the compromise. We are starting to enjoy political correctness instead of the principles. We are trying to please everyone, and at the end, we are pleasing nobody. And uh, as a former political scientist, let's look to the latest movies. Let's say James Bond. One of my friends, Andrew Michta, was, was I think, very correctly noticing, telling that, look, Usually, this movie was made in order to correspond to the uh, concrete, particular challenges that we are undergoing. And we all know what those challenges are in Pacific, all right? We know how, for instance, such country as China is challenging the existing order. We know how Russia is challenging the existing order. But what is driving behind the Hollywood? What is driving behind the movies which 40, 50 years ago were bringing us to the principles and to the value system, which were showing the greatness of our societies, of liberal democracy. They are making compromise, I think, in my understanding, just in order to make this movie available to people and make cash and money. What is going on with our big corporations, Facebook, Instagram, other places? When I have a fake um, a personalities using my, con my, my photo for some bad things, for me, it takes ages, you know, to get through the artificial intelligence or mechanics which are behind the algorithms in this corporation. So yes, on the one hand, the revolution of technologies was providing us with opportunities. But the, at the same time, they are also making a lot of possibilities for gray area and for the disruption of our societies. So we are not anymore actually standing behind our fundamental values, even if we speak about this. But in fact, we are disrupting this. And that gives authoritarian countries like, like Russia and others possibility simply to relax in the armchair and simply look where we have these openings, like this hybrid attack on the border, because they know that the West would like to uh, you know, invite immigration, would like to uh, invite uh, uh, other cultures, etc. We are speaking about multiculturalism. So they tell, OK, they like it. We will provide this to you. Let's see how you will respond. So actually, and then they are enjoying this disarray. So I think that um, our response here in Latvia is a technical one. Uh, we are trying as much as we can to prepare our society in other levels, in other institutions for such type of a correct responses in the gray zone. But we will probably not be extremely successful until we will not tackle as a Western liberal democracy the core question, where are we heading with all this? Are we actually not disrupting ourselves? And are we not becoming, in fact, a slave of uh, rising artificial intelligence, which will be soon smarter than average of our electorate? And they will decide by algorithms, because of the clicks, because of money, who will be elected, not the people who will be confused in a gray zone. So, uh, I don't want to confuse you more, but I am, I, I am for technologies. I'm not telling that we have to you know, uh, live like uh, 
some kind of a primitive societies without technologies. But the problem is we are increasingly losing control of this. So we cannot anymore master ourselves within this new environment. And the authoritarian countries are using this because they have much more control of these things. So they can use this, at least at this moment, against us much better. Exactly. The, the more convenient life becomes, the more vulnerable our societies become as a result. Before I turn the word over to Minister Hippie, I want to, first of all, see if there are any hands. Uh, there is one in the back. So if I combine you, sir, with my next question to Minister Hippie. So if you come to the front, yeah, if you, if you come to the, I think that's the way uh, we can best hear you. And then we'll combine that with the next question for Minister Hippie. And uh, in the meantime, I will also uh, encourage others on, on Slido to submit more questions. There are excellent ones already that I'm really inspired by. Okay, go ahead. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Shota Guineria from the Baltic Defense College. And I uh, have a question regarding the thresholds. And uh, I wanted to remind everybody in the audience here that Gerasimov very clearly told us that what they're trying to do is to achieve foreign policy goals without direct use of military power. But this does not always work out well for Russia. And in Georgia and Ukraine, they had to use military force actually to influence the foreign policy course of, of those countries. But having said this, uh, where is actually that threshold going? Uh, there were some instances mentioned here. If the threshold does not go beyond uh, targeting the center of gravity of the United States by attacking the election system, if it does not go uh, beyond uh, uh, using uh, weapon-grade chemical weapons in UK, if it does not go beyond uh, uh, blowing up uh, armament factory in the Czech Republic. So, does this ambiguous threshold actually help to deter, or it is in turn inviting the adversaries to actually operate below that threshold of conflict and try to uh, influence our public opinion, influence our, our vulnerable groups, influence our decision-making systems, knowing that there will be no response because these actions are below the threshold of conflict. So, is that threshold really helpful here? Thank you. That's an excellent question that I'll invite you to tackle, Minister. <laughs> well, the honest answer is I don't know. And I, I, I think about this all the time, because on the one hand, I accept the premise of your question, that a, a, a clearer threshold that our adversaries know and understand is a deterrent from them to go beyond it and to do the things that we find truly sort of unacceptable to our societies or to, 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 um, to those of our allies. But on the other hand, that then, if you, are, if you are so clear, you then risk inviting all sorts of activity below the threshold that you set. And so that ambiguity is in some ways not unhelpful, but what it gives rise to is a sort of constant testing of the boundaries. And what I fear is that within the construct of an alliance, the fact that each time the boundary may or may not have been crossed, there's then a whole political process to go through in the case of NATO in the North Atlantic Council to discuss whether the threshold has been crossed and you know, that that in itself further emboldens our adversaries to keep posing us those sorts of political challenges. Um, one of the vehicles that the, uh, the UK and our great friends in the beer drinking parts of Europe uh, okay. have, um, have put together is the Joint Expeditionary Force, the JEF. And I mean, the JEF is, uh, is not a replacement for NATO. The beauty of the JEF is it can be all things to all people and people can sort of opt in and out depending on, on what their appetite is. But the advantage of that sort of opt-in mentality is that the Jeff is able to react much more quickly to the sorts of threats that might tie the North Atlantic Council in knots for months. And I think that there's no surprise, therefore, that our, our great friends in the Baltic uh, and in the Nordic countries have seen real utility in this. And it's, it's potentially a model not to uh, undermine NATO, but to complement NATO, that these sort of informal alliances of like-minded nations who are minded to 
be able to react more quickly and more decisively whilst the political process in NATO unfolds, I think adds real, real value. Um, so I, 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 I hate not being able to answer your question exactly, but I, I just, I don't think that to, to set a threshold has value in that we're much clearer with our adversaries. And I would have thought that, you know, not using chemical weapons in the homeland of the United Kingdom would have been a sort of thing above the threshold if you were to draw one. But by the same token, if we were to draw it, we would invite all sorts of cyber attacks, disinformation, um, you know, attacks on our, uh, on our sort of uh, civil infrastructure, on our financial system, whatever else, with our adversaries safe in the knowledge that we've basically said that, that, is not a, that that's below the threshold. The other thing I'd add, just very finally, sorry, uh, is there has to also be a thing that is, there's a sort of cumulative, there's, there's, there's cumulative activities that combined cross the threshold. That has to be something we need to also get our heads around. That we shouldn't say that one attack against our national energy system that shuts down the grid, that's an above the threshold activity and everything else isn't. Actually, you know, a cumulative over time, attacks on our, on our, on our uh, IT systems that cause damage to our civil infrastructure or put uh, put lives at risk, that over time that has to be something that, that crosses the threshold. And that's a really important conversation that we as policymakers within the alliance need to get our head around and that NATO, in order to remain its in order to be relevant in the gray zone, and I go back to my point that NATO's relevance in this is unquestioned because it is its existence as a superior military alliance that forces adversaries into the gray zone in the first place. But if NATO is to play in the gray zone, we need to be much better at bringing in all of the instruments of government and being able to accelerate the political discussion around what has happened to us in order to be able to respond in a more relevant pace. Excellent point about the accumulation. And I, I, I think the, uh, so if, if you go next, uh, after Frederick, who I'll bring in now, um, if we, the, the, the problem, for example, with cyber attacks is that, that we want to prove beyond reasonable doubt, meaning beyond, at, at, the level where, uh, uh, at, at the level where our courts operate, which is the, the level we have set ourselves, then it's almost impossible to prove in any sort of speedy fashion uh, the, uh, the, uh, um, the provenance of a cyber attack, meaning we can never do anything about it. But if we instead uh, count the, the collective number of attacks that we think have originated from a certain country, then we, we can use that, I think, as, as a basis for, for um, uh, deterrence messaging and pro possibly punishment. Uh, before I bring you in, Ian, I want to bring Fred again, and then uh, Ian and then uh, you, sir, and then I have uh, excellent questions here that I still have to read out. Okay, thank you. My name is Fredrik Leikvist. I'm director of Stockholm, School, uh, Stockholm Center for Eastern European Studies, and I used to work as Sweden's ambassador for countering hybrid threats. This is a follow-up on Shota's question. Uh, I mean, we clearly need uh, better intelligence, better situational awareness. We need resilience. Those are no-brainers. But we also need the countermeasures, the deterrence uh, apart. Uh, do you, and, and I think we need to think in deterrence in a different way than we have thought about military deterrence. Do you see that we have developed a new strategic culture over the last year of putting together a, deter a hybrid deterrence toolbox, and both on the national level but also in the international cooperation, EU and NATO, and what is the role also of international cooperation in deterrence? Okay. Let me take a shot at that because I want to follow off the minister's point about threshold. I, I agree with him totally. <laughs> You really don't know when you cross the threshold until, until you cross the threshold in it. And there's probably some advantages to that. But the biggest concern I have is not that our efforts are our efforts to build a to toolbox. We're actually doing that. There's a lot more we need to do. I think in the information domain, we're clearly having an inadequate allocation of resources to that. Much more needs to be done. But when you have a toolbox, that's just not good enough. You have to have the will to use the toolbox. And what struck me about hybrid warfare over the last decade is if you look back 10 years ago, you had fairly limited amounts of attacks against our societies by our adversaries. And you fast forward today, 
It's assassinations. It's energy cutoffs. It's election interference. Uh, the list goes on and on. It's attack on our infrastructure. It's gotten more aggressive. Uh, it's gotten broader in scope. But what has the West's response been to that? It's been largely passive. Because we're not imposing sufficient penalties on our adversaries that leads them to d decide it's not in their interest to do that. And I think one thing we ought to be talking about is what is the role of offense in our strategy in this? So if, it if a, an autocracy comes in and mucks around in our election, should we just sit there and say, don't do this? Because the or we, should we start going into their polity? and start losing, using our advantages to destabilize their regime. So it'll make them think twice about undertaking such an action again. Until we get a serious discussion going on the offense side of this, we're just going to be in a perpetual state of being constantly attacked. And at some point, either intentionally or unintentionally, one of these, these, these aggressions in the hybrid realm will unfortunately cross over the threshold, and we're going to be in a far more dangerous situation. We have to think about offense. Mm. If I can add, Ian, uh, offense uh, as the Terence messaging, not offense uh, uh, carried out straight away, because if, if then we are, we are stuck in, in constant escalation, the point is, I think, to signal that we'll do something and then hopefully not have to do it. Uh, I'll bring but, you but in. But the point is, you, you have to do something. Yeah. And right now, we're doing pinprick responses. Well, we're, we're sending it to Marsh. We're deterred by our adversaries clear intent towards asymmetric escalation. And that, that is a great weakness, actually, of ours. I think we sort of, I instinctively agree with you, not that we should seek to interfere in the democratic process of other countries, because I think that would undermine our values proposition. But our ability to communicate to their audience around our values and why it is better to, have to, to, to make people ask the question of the society in which they're living we don't do anywhere enough of. And you know, Hollywood used to be the great vehicle for that. There was, a, you know, there was a sort of, now I don't know that Hollywood did it out of ideological further. I think Hollywood did it because to Western audiences, that was, sold. that sold. It's what people wanted to go and see. And they would not get in Russia anyway at the time. Well, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I just, I, you know, I don't, I sort of, you know, to, we, we fear asymmetric escalation. We fear that the other side don't play by the same rules as we do. They don't hold their politicians to account in the same way that our electorates hold us to account. And that gives them a real advantage. And I think we've got to find a way without compromising on our values where we do give as good as we get in terms of how we challenge within their societies. Well, may I say a few words? I think somehow I feel today here at this panel um, a little bit more philosophical. Look, uh, I think one of our problems is actually our strengths. Because since uh, our forefathers, uh, ancient Greeks and Romans, we got an idea that we always need to find a universal approach. I would uh, challenge and tell that, in fact, those adversaries, authoritarian adversaries, they are not uh, people or countries which or cultures which inherited exactly this. And that makes us different. I think that in order to answer to the gray zone attacks, we must make ourselves more flexible and think out of the box, which means maybe we should consider that uh, there must be kind of a floating threshold from time to time. Because until, if they know very clearly on the one hand that this is a threshold, they will not overrun this, and uh, this will be a deterrence. But if they see that we might have, in some occasions, a floating threshold, then they will be much, much more careful also with gray zone attacks. And again, example is that I, in my view, the threshold is overrun in a sense as far as the hybrid attacks on the borders of, of these three countries at this moment. And commission is still thinking in Brussels according to threshold, which is wrong. So if there would be a correct response, if we would get a few hundred million, three countries to in, make the right installments, we'll be much better prepared for this. And they would know that we take it seriously. Now they see we don't take it seriously. Uh, if I may add, uh, Minister, this comes back to what, what uh, the greatest deterrence uh, theorist of, of uh, recent decades, Thomas Schelling, what he liked to talk, used to talk about, which is the element of surprise uh, and fear. So how, you have to create an element of, of, of fear uh, by creating an element of surprise, or otherwise the other side will always uh, go all the way up to, to the, the threshold that you know you have that that the other side knows you have established and, and go there, but not farther. Over to you. Right. 
Well, thank you, Alan Riley, Atlantic Council. In fact, my, uh, my, Ian, to some degree, has stolen my thunder. In the, in the sense, the, the point I was making, I was, going, I was going to make, was that we are being far too reactive, and that we actually do need to go on the offence. Okay, and the offence with our values. But this surely is, is, is possible. I mean, I'll give you one example, which I think would work very well with our, fa uh, our values. Karen Duisha, the late, great Karen Duisha, in her book, Putin's Kleptocracy, estimates the amount of bribery theft within the Russian system is about $300 billion a year. That's equivalent to the same size as the Russian state budget. Most of that money gets exported to the West. It's illegal, tainted capital. Why are we not simply seeking to seize that and put it in a fund for the future Russian people? That for the Russian people in the future. The point if we do that is we really put a bright line saying the people running your country are a bunch of crooks. We are holding that money for you. Uh, it is there. We are putting up, you know, we are then saying we are, as in the Cold War, we are the shining city on the hill. We are working with our values and we are seriously destabilizing them. And that's the price they're paying for trying to destabilize us. And there are, I think, processes by which we can do that. I see the US government is. Uh, now talking with its executive memo uh, on uh, June the 3rd about anti-corruption being a national security or corruption being a national security issue. But we can expand this across the West to actually seize the, uh, identify freeze and seize those assets and put them in, put, put them in public funds available for, for the Russian people for the future. That would really scare the regime. That would have an impact. That would be proactive, and it would, would, would be with our values. I think things like this could work, but it requires a different sort of mentality to the endless reaction to whatever depravity or nonsense Moscow is doing this week. That's excellent, point. excellent point. So I'll, I'll just read uh, a couple of the questions here so that we get to them. Uh, NATO has been in a defensive alliance. Can it go on the offensive against uh, hybrid threats, uh, meaning gray zone threats? Uh, where is the line? Is this different for nations uh, and NATO as an organization? I think we have discussed that already. Uh, is the gray zone not a function uh, of the international economic interdependence that NATO and allies, uh, allies have with adversaries? Should interdependence be reduced? Uh, third question I wanted to highlight, is the gray zone fostering a return to, co to Cold War? So we have three minutes left, so I'll give the three speakers one minute each to, to uh, uh, or 60 seconds each to, to uh, have... Uh, a quick go at, at these rather fundamental questions. Starting with you, Minister Pavrix. Uh, I'll be short. Well, yes, we are defensive alliance, but sometimes defense means also offense. I think we must not uh, give a chance to others to counter us in a sense, so we must be ready to tell them you don't do this. As far as interdependence, well, uh, we cannot uh, disrupt the existing world, but of course COVID-19 showed us that uh, in some ways, our interdependence was not extremely smart. For instance, uh, protection gear, which we could not produce ourselves, etc. So we have to develop our own capacities, too, nationally as well. This is what we do here. And is the gray zone fostering a return to Cold War? Look, uh, one of the speakers already are in questions mentioned that with um, uh, Georgia. If we do not give the right and timely response to attacks in the gray zone, then one of the things are set in a right place, the black zone might follow. Thank you. Fantastic timing, Minister Heapy. I will try and match that brevity. Uh, so, sir, uh, I reserve the right to pinch your idea as my own. Uh, I think that, um, I think that you know, we discussed quite keenly the idea of sanctions against the Russian administration. We like the idea. But the idea that the consequence of the sanction is a sort of wealth fund in exile as an incentive for, for sort of bringing, I, I, I like that. Um, I think that NATO can go on the offensive, not, not that I think that we should be as belligerent and, or as malign, because I think our values matter. That is the core part of our proposition. But fundamental to the UK's integrated review is this idea of forward presence. So we make ourselves more visible, we change the calculus for adversaries, and that more assertive posture has impact. I agree absolutely that interdependence is a fundamental weakness within the Western Alliance. We made a judgment to take Huawei out of our 5G mobile phone system. Uh, the last few weeks have demonstrated the importance of energy independence or at least energy security that doesn't rely on your key adversary. Um, 
is the gray zone fostering return to the Cold War? I mean, I don't like the term Cold War in this context, but fundamentally, the competition we are now in is that. Uh, and um, does uh, Ian's advice mean that James's point about the Russians would shift competition? Perhaps, but yes, I think it does. I mean, that, and that's the point. It's a sort of game of cat and mouse. The more overwhelming you are militarily, the more you force your adversaries below the threshold. If you take your eye off the ball militarily, they go back above the threshold, and arguably, that's more risky still. Fantastic. Ian, 60 seconds. Might be easy. What they said, but, but seriously. <laughs> <laughs> you know, on a point on NATO, uh, yes, NATO has to be more engaged in, 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 in the hybrid domain. But we have to understand what NATO's per primary purpose it is. It is to throw lead down range. It is to fight battles. It is not an economic ministry. It is not an information ministry. Uh, those dimensions, energy security, information operations, uh, financial engagements, those are going to remain outside of NATO. And I don't want NATO dragged in it. They have to be coordinated. It, but the fulcrum of those operations will come out in other areas, just as it was during the Cold War. Uh, I get worried that NATO is being kind of smorgasbord with too many different tasks that can actually distract it from what it actually does best and is most configured for. So it's going to be more coordination, but more efforts, particularly on institutions like the European Union, which can work in, in, in the financial realm. In the information realm, it's going to be national ministries. I, I think it will be very ineffective to try to fight the information war through NATO, through the EU. It's got to be by nation by nation, coordinating with the weight in their own organizations. Every nation should have like a USIA. So I'll close with, with just one final point is that until we start pushing back, some people don't like the word offensive, um, but until we resp responding more assertively and making clear to our adversaries that these shenanigans in these domains are going to have a price, they're going to continue pushing us. And what, what, what I'm worried about, they're going to become bolder and bolder as they become in the past, which actually cr increases the risk of something dramatic crossing the threshold to actually having occurring. So in order to keep the peace, we actually have to be more forceful. Thank you all, and thank you uh, for, for, the, for the excellent questions. And I hope you'll continue discussing uh, during lunch, which I believe follows now. And uh, I, I, the reason I hope that is that we didn't get to all the the, the, the issues uh, that could have been discussed and, and all the ideas that could have presented, I'm sure they, they exist in the room. So uh, with that, uh, go forth and discuss gray zone defense and, and we'll see you later.